Hello everyone, my name is Michna Stojka, I'm a character to deal with side effects software and this is the pre-recorded version of the masterclass that I held at Everything Procedural in uh, Breda, Netherlands at Breda University. I hope you will enjoy it, thanks for being here. Before we dive straight into this workshop, there are a few things I want to mention. So first and foremost, obviously the most important is what exactly we will be building. Uh, hopefully you've read the description of the video, but nonetheless the final result will look something like this, roughly, where we build this fairly simple reconstruction effect for this uh, marble statue that you see up there. And we're going to build a skeleton for, for the actual thing and then manipulate it, just have some fun with it really to see what the, the capabilities are. So that being said, if you want to follow along using exactly the same meshes, then I will be hopefully providing in the description links to the two meshes that you see up on the screen, which is the statue and the table. So these both have been downloaded from polyhaven.com. Um, again, you will get the link uh, to get them if you, if you want to use the same. In terms of their setup, it's pretty simple. I won't be diving much into this, where I'm just sort of transforming them into place, adding the materials, which you can't see right now. This is mainly for like the end result or for a, a nice shot at the end. And I'm doing the same for the marble statue, where I'm just transforming this on top of the table, adding the materials and just cleaning up some attributes. So with this out of the way, we can now begin the actual process of breaking down this scene and um, have some fun. So let's get started. The first step here was to essentially get that breakage happening because what we get in from the from polyhaven.com is just this this simple poly mesh so it's not broken into pieces it doesn't have a skeleton it's just a very simple um, simple mesh so because of this uh, we have to process it first of course and break it apart and probably the best way or easiest way to break it apart and have it look convincing is to use uh, rbd so I will walk you through my setup for breaking it apart and then having that animation uh, happen using RBD. But I'm going to make it a bit faster. Um, then I want to go through the rest of the scene, just mainly because this is not exactly within the scope of this workshop. And honestly, I'm quite a beginner when it comes to like just breaking up stuff using RBD. So there's a myriad of other tutorials and ways out there, uh, probably much better or more extensive than this one to do it. But in case you want to follow along, I want to make sure you have the opportunity to have a quick look at what I did. So I'll present this network really quickly. You can see it's kind of broken up into two main parts. We have one on the left and one on the right. The right one is the main sort of breaking the statue apart and then running the solver. And then one on the left has to do with an object that's meant to hit the statue to have the destruction happen in a more interesting manner. So the first thing that we're going to do, of course, is bring in the statue uh, with a via an object merge. So it is the same statue we've configured that I've shown previously with a transformer material, nothing else. We also bring in the table here. And you can see that the statue lies on top of the table. So we have it fall from the table, making it uh, of a more interesting um, animation overall. Then once we have the statue uh, ready to go, I'm going to use a RBD material fracture here. So this is a very powerful SOP that essentially fractures the object for us. I can show here the exploded view already so you can see the result of the fracture. And I'll walk you through what I did in terms of parameters. So I kept it fairly simple. Um, I have other primary fracture, two levels of fracture. So we keep everything at default, which is set to concrete, which is what I was looking for anyway. And then for the primary fracture, we do uh, one, which is scatter points nine. And for the second one, scatter points two. I think this is the only thing I've changed in terms of the, the default values. And honestly, this, there's no real science behind this. It was just a trial and error, seeing what looks good, both in terms of this exploded view, so how much detail we have, and also in terms of the actual destruction that I kept playing with. Uh, you can go ahead and under detail, add extra details for the inside of the, of the parts. Um, this will work, uh, especially because we get this proxy geometry as well output. So it's not gonna make your simulation much, much heavier. But for the purpose of this workshop, I kept it simple. And I also added chipping, so I enabled chipping. Uh, most of these values are probably at default, just change some seeds and chipping ratio to get something that doesn't look too cluttered. Again, a bunch of trial and error, there's no real 
you know, step by step on how to do this or why I did it this way. Um, afterwards, I have this UV layout and material here. This is also kind of an optional step, but I think it makes a lot of sense, right? We want to actually let's see if we can even see the difference here for the exploded view. So you can see the UVs on the inside parts, and after I UV layout them, uh, they don't look don't look much better because I haven't really spent a lot of time uh, laying them out, but it's that's a bit better in terms of the actual result at the end. So if you have a material on the statue and you want to keep the inside looking more uh, realistic, then this is definitely a required step. You can ignore it for the purpose of this tutorial if you so wish to. Then before we move to the actual solver, let's have a look at how I, what I did on the left side with the object that's meant to hit the statue to break it apart. So for this I chose a sphere, a pretty simple sphere. Uh, just again, we're trying to keep everything uh, quite simple and fast to, to set up. I positioned the sphere somewhere in space in relation to the statue, uh, just as a starting point. And then um, what I ended up doing for the motion of the sphere is actually uh, more of a procedural approach. So at first I just used, like, was using transform stops to transform the sphere to space and just have it hit the, the statue at a particular frame. But as I was iterating through the uh, the various like breakages and stuff, I honestly decided it was probably faster a way to iterate like this. So my choice here was to create a simple ballistic path setup. So essentially I'm packing the sphere first just to get a single point for it, uh, because that's the only thing I want to drive. We had the ballistic path, not multiple, because obviously the sphere when I created is just a, a poly mesh. Could probably turn this into an actual primitive <coughs> and have a single point on it that also works. Um, but yeah, I went ahead and did it like this. Uh, and then in this wrangle, it's a pretty simple wrangle, but it's quite fun. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at the, the statue. So you can see here on the first input, I'm bring, bringing in a statue object. And then I'm getting a random point on that statue. That is a simple fit function. And I'm just using a randomizer based on the seed that's down here. So depending on what seed you're going to set, you're going to get a new point of the statue. And then I'll be creating another attribute called target P on my input points, so on this sphere essentially, because it's a single point now, that uh, kind of holds the position of that random point from the sphere, uh, from the statue, sorry. So this target PT is then consumed in the ballistic path. So this just looks at the target position target P and looks at where my sphere is for the, the start position and then that attribute for the end position. So this creates this nice path from the sphere to the statue. Um, and yeah, it's quite simple to set up and I can just play with the seed to get a different point every time. Then I'm not really doing any sort of fancy physics stuff with the ballistic path. So I'm not really launching the sphere on that path using physics because again, I want to keep things simple. Instead, I'm just using a simple path deform and I'm just offset the position based on a few frames. So this just is a linear, linear drive of the that path on that path. And I'm also adding some rotation just for the fun of it to make things more interesting. And that's the sphere, essentially, and this is supposed to hit that statue to cause it to break apart. Then I'm merging that sphere together with the table, so we have the both of these objects as collision geometry, and then we fit them both in the RBD bullet solver. So on the solver itself, uh, I'm going to start with the output, uh, with the orient attribute here. So this is an important thing to output because we're going to be using this later on. I'll explain a bit later on why we need this, but essentially um, each point, or rather the RBD will make sure to give us the rotational data of each point on that statue uh, so we know how it rotates through space as it gets simulated. This is essentially we get that, that data for free from the solver, so we might as well use it later on if we have it. Then other collision, just want to set this to deforming so we get this sphere uh, animating through time. And then also set the ground plane so the pieces have something to fall onto. And then under properties, I did play around a bit with the density, just lowered it a little bit uh, to get the result that I was after. And then also it's sleeping so that the pieces uh, come to a stop from the seam a bit more quickly um, and don't, don't like rotate too much uh, once they hit the, the ground. And that's essentially all the, the, the values I had to change on the RBD solver. So again, keeping it very simple. And now if I play this, it's gonna take a little bit of time for it to seem, but you can see how the sphere hits the statue, breaks the head apart, and then has it sort of fall backwards um, off the table. Head breaks into multiple pieces, and you get that effect that I shown at the beginning of this video with um, the statue breaking apart. 
So I chose as an end frame, frame 190 for this sim. Uh, this was just mainly honestly to try and keep it as short as possible while keeping uh, having it look nice. So I kind of decided to stop it here with the pieces almost laying on the floor. You can see it still goes on for a few frames, but that's fine. I don't really want to extend it further. So we can say 190 is what we're happy with. And afterwards, I'm just doing some simple attribute cleanup and group cleanup. So this makes sure to delete non-selected and essentially saying I only want to keep orient and P, so clean everything else. And then on the group delete here as well, uh, we want to kill those groups because I don't really uh, plan on using them later on. And after all of this, I'm doing a file cache, which exports uh, this animation as a, uh, a cache on disk. So we can then bring it in the scene again later when we're going to use it to build the skeleton. So this is kind of the first step um, of the, the process. We have the statue, we break it apart. Once we're happy with the effect, then we can proceed to build up the skeleton. And of course, keep in mind that, you know, we can always come back to this and adjust the simulation if we want to. This is by no means the final, final, final result. It's just, you know, I'm happy with it so far, so I can definitely proceed into building the more um, sort of technical kin effect skeleton first and then we'll see if we have to go back and forth. The next step is to take our RBD simulation that we've just cached to disk and turn that into a proper KineFX skeleton. Remember, our goal is to create this skeleton uh, from this cache, or this whole character rather, so then we can use the KineFX tools to manipulate the animation as we put it back together. So I'm gonna dive here into the build skeleton and you can see that we have a, a couple of things here. Um, don't get too frightened, uh, they're not that difficult and hopefully the thought process will make a lot of sense. So it should be easier for you to follow. So first things first, uh, there are two streams here, uh, left and right. The, they're both doing the same thing. So I'm gonna explain the left one and then I'm gonna go over to the right and explain the difference just so you can um, get an understanding of the various options you have available to make this work. So here we have a file cache and we're just bringing in the file from disk. Now, one thing that I already went ahead and did here is instead of reading the cache as we exported it, which was essentially the breakage effect, uh, I am reading it back backwards. So when I'm specifying the file name here, instead of just going for dollar frame dollar sign frame, which means read the frames of the timeline, I'm saying get my last frame uh, plus the first so one. Uh, minus the current timeline frames. And this has the effect of playing the animation in reverse. So the actual cache stays the same and will in fact stay the same throughout this workshop. We don't actually touch that cache at all, but instead we just focus on uh, playing it back in reverse because we are gonna make a, we're gonna be making a character out of this. So we're gonna be storing that animation on a skeleton. So we don't exactly care or we don't want that cache to be um, playing in reverse also. We're, we're fine to, to use it as it is. So this is already a, a neat little trick that gives us the, the re reverse uh, motion uh, quite quickly. A, a quick asterisk here is if you want this 190, i.e. your last frame, to be a bit more procedural, uh, you, can, you can set it up in a different way. You could, you know, potentially uh, read up the amount of files you have in the, in the file cache to to set that as the number, or you can do you know some other global parameters and all the rest of it if you really want to keep things a bit more uh, easy to change. But for this scene, I'm happy with 190 as a hard-coded value. Just know that if you're gonna do this, try and sort of make a mental note or even like a proper sticky note, you know, um, saying, you know, hard-coded value and then do something like this. So you don't, remember, don't forget where you've uh, where you've used these kind of kind of things. Anyway, so moving on. Now I want to explain quickly the thought process behind creating the skeleton for this or the actual character itself. So then we can easily follow along through the network and understand what why am I doing what I'm doing. So a KineFX character. Let me bring in a simple example. Uh, as you know, or if you don't know, I'll, you'll know now. Um, consists of three sort of different streams or three different sort of di the data types if you want. We've got our rest geometry, which represents the skin uh, that's at rest pose, right? So for our statue, I'm gonna probably go for like the last frame of the animation, so this one, where we have the statue all in one piece and not moving. So this would be our rest geometry. Then we have our capture pose, 
and this represents the skeleton of this statue at rest pose. So we don't have that yet, so we have to build the skeleton, of course. Um, and then we also have the animated pose, which is the same skeleton as the capture pose, but that holds the actual animation data, right? So we also don't have that, so we have to build both of these. Now for the skeleton, for the skin, sorry, uh, it's a simple way to get it, right? We just use a time shift, again, hard-coded values, so you can, you know, keep duplicating this around if you really want to, but again, I'm, I'm happy with this for now. Um, we can just time shift the skin to a frame 190, and now you can see it no longer plays, so it's static. So this already gives us that stream. So check one out of three. Now we have to build a skeleton. So because our cache is animated, right, then um, we can easily build the animated pose first, and then probably we can even use the same skeleton for the rest pose. So how do we plan on building this? Now, because our goal is to modify the way that this skeleton comes back, the way that this character comes back together, then I probably want a joint per piece. So each piece has its own joint that then I can you know, manipulate or animate on top of this reconstruction effect to get the desired result. So in order to do this, um, I'm already like sort of said a few keywords, which was per piece, right? So this should already, or for me at least, uh, gets me thinking to doing a, a like an a iteration over all the pieces. So you just do it for each connected piece, which drops all the nodes for you already. So this is a very nice little default that you have in the shelf directly, in the tab menu, sorry, which you can also see down here. And what this does is the connectivity SOP creates a connectivity attribute for each primitive that belongs to the same piece. So you can see we've got about 171 pieces, which is correct. I double-checked, you can trust me. Then the for loop, so these uh, orange nodes here, uh, will go through each of the pieces one by one, right? So you can only see here that we've got just this piece here, because this is the last one. And inside this loop, we can do something for each of those pieces. Now, the compile block here is just for extra speed. You don't really need it. Uh, feel free to add it, though, if you, if you want to follow along one-to-one. -one. But it's not going to modify the result in any way. So we've got this sort of for each piece stuff set up, and now we want to do something for each of these pieces. So I said I want a joint per piece. Now, the easiest place, if you want, uh, to put that joint would be in the middle of the piece, right? Because there's no point in trying to figure out uh, like a different position of the bounding box. The middle will be just fine because we want to manipulate that piece through space, and that uh, makes the most sense to me at least. So in order to do that, we need to get the average position of all the points in the piece, right? Because we have multiple points and we want a single one. So we could just choose a point random on this piece, but then, you know, each piece has a different point count and each of the points can be in a different position. So another reason to use the center of that piece because that's consistent across all pieces. So to do that, I have here a wrangle, which does this point creation. Now it's just three lines, so don't get scared if you're not uh, very happy uh, to use VEX all, all the time. This is a very simple setup. What I'm doing is I'm creating a point, so just add point, that we create uh, at this position. So what is this position? You can see it's a, we read it from a detail from stream 1. So it's stream 1 is this attribute promote p. So if I come here to attribute promote p, this is a uh, quite neat little trick that you could use. Um, that's a very, very nice and it's uh, fast to set up. So the attribute promote, has this original name P, so we get the P, the position uh, from a point, and we promote this to a detail, so we create a single attribute out of all the point attributes in the input, which remember, are all the points that correspond to the piece that we're currently iterating over, and we use the promotion method average. So what does this do? Is it creates a detail attribute that represents the average position of all the points in that piece, which essentially means the center. So this gives us the center of the piece in a very simple manner. And then the attribute wrangle here takes that value and builds the point where that is, right? So you can see it's in the center of the of this uh, this shape. And then the next two little things have to do with getting the data that we're interested in over. So one is the orient. Now you remember what I mentioned in the, the previous 
where we are still working with RBD that we want to output the orient and this is why because the orient represents the rotational data and that is the same for all points in one piece because the piece is rigid so it does not deform and that means that through space Let's see if we can query the... Actually, we have to display this to get the proper... Uh, let's just do it up here. So you can see how this piece, that one, rotates over time. Each point, because it's rigid, each point will have the same rotation data. So this is equivalent to a single point essentially rotating the whole piece. The position, it's not the same because each point is offset from the rest, right? You can see their points, one here, one there, one there, one there, and so on and so forth. So the position is not the same, but the rotation is the same. So if you take all of these points and you rotate them by the same value, which is ex essentially what's happening here already, you will get this exact effect. So because we know this, we can very easily just copy this orient from the first point that we find. Because remember, it's all the same for all the points. So we just get orient from the first point of that piece and we copy it over to our joint. And it's the same for the name, because each of our primitives here belongs to the same piece, they are all named the same. So we can just use that here to get the name. Now the name, we don't necessarily have to. Uh, I'm just doing it here because I'm planning on using this later on for the capturing. So might as well transfer it over now. Um, if you're more comfortable in SOPs, and you're not a big fan of VEX, you can also just use an attribute copy to copy these attributes over um, to the stream instead of the wrangle, but because I already am making the point here, I decided to use this set point attribute in there. So that's it, okay? So hopefully the thought process here makes sense and it's simple to follow. And this gives us this. So we have a point cloud, 171 points, right? So for each piece, one point. Remember what I said about the class, 171 pieces. And now if we play back, you can see that they are actually animate as well. And this is of course because the input to this for loop is animated and then each point we create is based on the average position of each piece, which it is animating, so we are getting this effect. And that's almost it, honestly. Uh, the only last thing is we want to make sure that this is a valid KineFX skeleton. And there's a very simple way to do this, uh, even if you're not familiar with what KineFX uh, expects in order to uh, treat a point cloud uh, or a hierarchy as a valid skeleton, you can use the rig doctor. And this will essentially take care of everything for you. So uh, at the top here, we've got this initialized missing name and sanitized names, which is not necessary because we already have the correct names. So you can ignore this, but uh, it's just the default values. It's not gonna do anything really. And then we also have this initialized transform. So this is something that you want to do here in order to get the, the last missing bit. So KineFX works with a P, so position of a point, a name of a point, and a transform attribute for that point. The, the, the transform is the rotation uh, data of that point as a three by three matrix. So if we now check what attributes out of those we have, you can see we have name, orient, and p. So name and position are already checked, <coughs> but we don't have a transform, we have an orient. Now luckily, Rig Doctor is smart enough to know that orient represents a rotation attribute, because it's a common used attribute when it comes to like various simulation workflows in Houdini. So if we check these initialized transforms and convert instance attributes, the Rig Doctor will take that orient, and it's going to build a transform out of it. And that's very simple. Like, we don't have to do anything. There's no math involved here. We just have to let the rig doctor know that we are interested in doing this and that our stream probably comes from somewhere that uses Orient, and he will take care of this for us. And what this gives us is a bunch of KineFX joints. So, if, for example, look at this joint right here. You can make it a bit bigger. You can see that as I play, those axes rotate. Like, no, of course, they rotate a bit crazy because the piece is rotating like crazy when it comes back up. But you see we've got rotation. And this is the KineFX Python state. So this means that our actual skeleton uh, must be valid. Uh, we can, we're going to check this again <coughs> a bit later when we actually uh, build the whole thing, the whole character. But that's it. So that's the setup that we need in order to create that skeleton from our pieces. 
And now once this is done, then it's very simple, right? So we essentially checked our skin, we checked our animated pose, we have the rest pose left. And that's very really basic, basic to do because all we have to do really is use the same skeleton that we have here <coughs> and time shift this again to the last frame, right? So this says, well, you know, I, I need that skeleton at rest pose. This is the rest pose that I've chosen. So I'm just going to time shift it and that's it. Um, <coughs> and then we can, before we check the joint deform, which essentially uh, checks for the, or deforms that character, the last step is to also make sure we skin this to the joints, right? Because that's how a, a character works. You've got the skin that's uh, and the joints that have some weight and they affect the skin, they deform the skin. So to do that, there's a very simple way, of course. <clears throat> we have our skin here, this dense mesh, just time shifted. And we have our skeleton here, time shifted, right? So they don't move. We want to capture at rest pose. There's this capture packed geosop, which does this based on an attribute for us. So if we have a look at the, the parameters here, you can see that we have pack input. Now this is required by this node in order to correctly uh, weigh or capture rather. So we want to pack our input, so we'll pack our skin, and we want to pack using the name because we already said each of our piece has a unique name and we have a unique name that corresponds to that piece on the skeleton, right? Because if you remember, when we create the point here, we use the name of the primitive that comes from the skin, essentially. So they are the same. So we're on a pack using name, which will create 171 packed pieces for us. Um, and then we want to capture by attribute. So we say, look on my skin for the name, look on my skeleton for the name, and if you find a piece on a skin with a joint on the skeleton that have the same name, just capture that skin part to that joint. And that's exactly what we want to do, right? Um, and then we unpack our output just to keep things clean. And that's it, all procedural, don't have to do any manual work here, and we can then do the final check to see if we have a valid character. We can plug everything into a jointy form, the same way you would do with an actual KineFX character. And now if I play back, you can see that we've got the same animation as the cache, except now we're playing it via a jointy form rather than via a file cache. And if I display both of them, you should see that they are exactly the same. So that's it. That's the whole process of creating from a file cache, create a valid KineFX character. So a quick thing I want to mention here before I show you the other option or the other variant or the other version of creating the same thing is that one thing I did try to begin with instead of doing this for loop per piece and creating a joint like this is I tried using a pack sop which you also might be thinking about um, and say pack by name okay and transfer name because this creates 171 points per each piece in their centroid. So this was a natural thing to look to think about for me because this is exactly what we're wanting to do, right? We want to create a joint per piece at the center and the pack already does this for us. But there's a little catch here why you can't use this method. So the pack in order to compute the centroid of the piece, it uses the bounding box of that piece. What does that mean? Let me show you here with this bound sop. So imagine that the pack does exactly this. It computes a bounding box per piece and calculates its center. This is fa way faster than computing uh, the average position of each of the points. That's why. But even though our points are rigid, they do rotate. So look at that box right there. You can see, okay, well, that's not. Uh, you can see how it changes over time. So you can see that the box itself doesn't stay the same uh, volume wise. It keeps changing. And the reason is because our piece rotates through space. So when you have a piece that rotates through space, then the computation of the bounding box will not stay um, the same, which means that you will get a centroid that's slightly offset with each frame, which will not work. Like your statue, if you're using this method, the statue at the end, when we bone deform it, when we joint deform it, it's going to look slightly offset position-wise. That's why it doesn't work. So keep this in mind 
if you are thinking about using pack or if you're wondering why haven't I used pack because it's a simpler method, that's why. All right, so before we move on, I want to talk about the alternative here. So I'm not gonna linger much here because uh, it's the very similar approach. The difference is in the way we compute the, the centroid. So I wanted to explore further this pack option because you know I wasn't completely happy with the fact that it didn't work out of the box. So I thought, how there's, is there any way that we can make it work? And of course, because this is Houdini, there is. So if you're comfortable with sort of some basic uh, transformation math, hopefully this will make some sense to you. If you're not, then don't worry. Um, you can always use the other method or you can try and follow along here and see what's going on. So I said right about now that the problem with the pack or the reason it doesn't work is because our, our pieces are rotating through space on each frame, which makes the bounding box to be computed uh, slightly different every time. So that means that in order to get the pack to work, we have to kill the rotation on these pieces, pack, and then re-rotate, okay? So how can we do this? Well, keep in mind that we have an orient. So our statue here, our file cache, so this is the file cache, okay? Our file cache has the orient attribute on the pieces, which indicates their rotation through space. So we can use that attribute to kill the rotation. And how do you do that? Is we build a matrix from it, a four by four matrix from the quaternion that's called orient. And then we transform by attribute. So we transform the whole geometry, each piece, essentially, by the inverse of this orient. So again, if you're comfortable with 3D math, this essentially means that each position, each point's position gets transformed by the inverse of the rotation, which will make it not rotate anymore. So the case you can see here, it looks a bit odd, but it stays put. It does not rotate anymore at all. It just translates. So now because the piece doesn't rotate, the bounds will stay the same on each frame. So we can safely pack, transform some attributes over as well. And then we can do another transform by attribute using the same X form that we computed up here, but this time we no longer invert. We want to apply the rotation back onto our pieces. And this will bring the, the statue exactly in the same uh, spot of where it was before, which is the pieces sort of rotating and building up correctly here. Okay. And now, once we have this stuff, we have essentially 171 points with a name attribute on them because we've transferred over the, the name when we packed here. And we can then easily create a, a rig doctor straight from it. We can remove the geometry and only keep the points. And this will be exactly the same thing as we did before. It's just that now, instead of doing the for loop you know, for each piece and creating a new point per piece, we just use the point that the pack stop is creating for us uh, after we've killed the rotation on the pieces. So, Keep in mind that this is possible um, and yeah, just feel free to use whatever method uh, makes more sense to you. So now we've got our basic character in place. And if we play this again, you can see that we've got that proper animation playing and it's in reverse as well. And it all comes from a joint form. So this is great. We have essentially procedurally created the character, a KinFX character from a file cache. There's a couple of uh, extra little things that I want to show in terms of uh, how we can extend this skeleton further to facilitate the modification for us. So one thing that I'm missing here, um, especially for this particular uh, iteration of the breakage, is that there are certain pieces, like for example, this one right here, right, which has two joints. So there are two pieces, two separate pieces. We can see that they're cracked, they're break, they're broken apart there. But the RPD didn't actually make them separate. So they stayed together throughout this whole simulation. But of course, because we iterate over the pieces, how we broke them in the RPD material fracture and not how the RPD solver breaks them, then we get two joints. Now, why this might be problematic is if I wanted to say, uh, look at the trajectory of this piece later on and change the trajectory, then it's a lot more complicated and honestly annoying to have to work with two joints instead of just one. So there's an option or there's a, something we could do about this uh, here before we move on to, uh, to the, the actual modification to help us a little bit on this front end. Um, what we can do, and this is what I'm doing down here. Uh, don't worry, it's, it's essentially the same thing uh, it's just there's a few things extra. 
So I'm going to skim through this a little bit because it should hopefully uh, make sense quite quickly. So what I want to do is instead of uh, creating a joint per piece, so for each piece that we have in the file cache creating a joint, I want to first figure out which pieces are merged together so they don't break apart and then make sure I treat those as a single piece. Okay, and you can see that we also have this huge piece here, the torso, which is basically just one, one piece. But if you look at how many joints we've got for it, it's like, I don't know, like 20, 30 or, or a lot of joints, right? So this is a bit annoying, especially again, if you want to deal with the actual motion trail of the object. Uh, and since it's a single object, then we might as well uh, treat it as such, even when we build the character. And luckily, there's a very simple way to do this. So remember what I did before up here, is I said, create a connectivity SOP. So for each piece, we have a unique identifier called class. Now, instead of doing this, I want to find a way to figure out which pieces are merged together or are sort of uh, uh, make a whole. To do that, we can use a simple fuse node here. So how exactly? So first things first is I'm picking a frame. So which frame do I want to compute my new pieces from, right? Because of course, if you look at the actual file cache, then this piece right here is one piece at frame one, but at frame 177, the whole character is one piece, right? So I have to choose the frame that we want to compute our pieces from. So I'm using a time shift for that here. You can also use a cache if you want. And I'm saying frame one, right? Because frame one is the frame at which all the pieces that can be broken during the simulation will already be broken. This is essentially the last frame of the breakage. Then I'm just using a simple fuse node that will fuse the pieces that are very close together into one. And then I'm using the connectivity to create the class. Okay, so let me show you what, does, uh, what the difference is. Uh, I'm gonna put this color, I'm gonna just do this connectivity. So this is the same thing we had before, right? I'm gonna do a color here. I'm going to do color uh, random from attribute, and I'm going to use a class. Uh, this is a primitive attribute. And you can see, you know, let's come to this piece right here, or even that one, which shows the result. You can see how we have two different colors because we have two different pieces. So if I come down here to this connectivity three and I plug this into the color one, you can see how we still have separate pieces here, but this one has turned into a single piece, right? The same as with this big one. So this one has is now a single piece as far as the connectivity is concerned. Uh, whilst here it's made out of a, a lot of multiple pieces. So this was a, honestly quite a nice surprise for me. I, I expected to have to do a bit more complicated setup in order to figure out which pieces remain whole after this, the, the sim, but the fuse seems to be exactly the tool for the job. So once this is set up, then we can of course just transfer over the class onto the time dependent stream here. So we computed that a single frame, but then we put it back onto our deforming mesh uh, on each frame. So the class will stay the same because we have the same point count, but we would be it will be computed from a single frame. And once this is done, then we can essentially run the same algorithm as we did before, uh, because we're iterating over each point one by one. Remember that. A few caveats here. So a few things have to change. Um, one of these things is in regards to how we treat the orient and the, the name. Okay, so if you remember up here, we I said that it is safe to just read the orient and the name from the first point or primitive of the piece because they're all the same. But now we no longer can do that because a piece or the concept of a piece right now can actually be made out of multiple pieces because we're doing this fuse up here, okay? So we have to slightly adjust for this. And how do we do that? So first and foremost, we can just uh, average out the orient the same way we average out position. So attribute promote is smart enough to understand that orient is a quaternion and it knows how to create that correct average for us. So this is very simple. It's the same thing we do with position. We now do it orient and we just create the orient from the average of all the points in the piece. But when it comes to name, we can't really average a name because it's a string, right? So we have to find another way to do this. And the best way to do this is to use the class because class is the only attribute that we currently have that is unique per piece that we want, right? So all this big chunk right here will have the same class attribute. It's not gonna be different because we create it in such a way. 
So now we can ditch the name, so not have the name, and you can instead set a class per point. And then when we come to the rig doctor, we can rely on the rig doctor to initialize the names for us. So now each of our points will be named, you know, point one, two, three, and so on and so forth. And we can see that we get 54 points instead of 171 points. So that's a lot of points that we got rid of because we don't actually end up with the pieces breaking each, uh, apart from each other. And once this is set up, then we also have to come over here to where we are doing the uh, the skin setup to the capture packed. And when we capture, we want to pack by class and capture by class. So keep in mind that our class represents now the connection between the skin and the joint because we no longer rely on the name of the piece. We rely on the class, which is kind of like our custom way of separating out the pieces, right? So we went a step further for what the, from what the <coughs> RBT material fracture gives us and we break the pieces apart or we separate the pieces apart uh, using our own sort of custom method. So it's the same principle, we're doing the same thing, it's just that we make use of this class attribute here instead of the name. And that's essentially it. Uh, all the other little things here, so this is not actually required. All the other things that you see here like attribute delete and transform, these are just uh, cleanup steps. So the transform is in order to get the character at rest frame to sit on, on the, at the origin. So I just wanted to have it cleaned up so it doesn't have any unwanted attributes and it's positioned right at the origin. And then we just rely on the deform pose to move that over or to move it in space. If we have a look at the actual skeleton result, because we haven't done that yet, you will be able to see that now this piece is a single joint. And if I rotate this round, you can see that the whole piece rotates. So this is no longer two joints, but it's just one but we can still manipulate it using a single joint, and that's the cool bit here. And the same as with this huge piece here, we have a single joint for it. <clears throat> okay, and that's basically it. So everything else stays the same. Again, a couple of cleanup steps here. Uh, I'm also translating the rest skeleton the same way I'm translating the skin, so it sits on, on top of the origin. And then I'm doing another computation to compute the local transform from world. Uh, this is not necessary. Uh, I just wanted to keep my character clean and uh, sync up because transform... Uh, well, actually, I think in this case, it might even manipulate the local transform already. So this is probably not even needed. And that's it. So now we have our character and we've even extended our skeleton. So we made it even more granular, even more careful about what exactly is going on within our, our, our file cache. Everything procedural, of course. And then I can just safely export this character using a character IO or even an FBX export if I really wanted to. Um, I'm doing a clip info here. A clip info is an attribute that's also used in KineFX quite wildly, especially when it comes to motion clip building and the like. Uh, this essentially, you know, is a, an attribute that sets or that tells the other nodes what's the length of our animation, if we have a clip name, what's our uh, rate of playback and so on and so forth. And I think it's a good idea to have this set up once, especially if you plan on using motion clips down the line, because then you can just keep using this attribute without worrying about configuring it multiple times. And once that's done, we can just come to our character IO here and export this save to disk as a character. And now this is ready to go for uh, modifying the animation or, you know, just essentially this is, this is proper KineFX land now. So we can go wild with the KineFX tools and sub tools and have some, some more fun in manipulating this uh, effect of the, the statue being rebuilt. So we just made sure that our skeleton is a bit more uh, granular to the actual pieces rather than building one per piece, right? So this should allow us to manipulate uh, chunks that stay together more easily. However, there is one last, last extra step that I uh, incorporated in this file in terms of skeleton building. And this has to do with building a joint that is responsible or that acts sort of as the parent hierarchy for all the head joints, respectively torso joints. So let me show you what I mean by showing you the final result here. So you see we have the jointy form, so this is the same thing, you know, it's playing. And then here's a rig pose with nothing on it. And you can see that now we have a hierarchy. This is not necessary. Um, I built it for this particular extension of the skeleton and I'll explain why. So now if I play this all stuff, it's all playing exactly the same way. But you can see we've got this head joint here, which we could use to manipulate the head itself. 
Okay, so I think this actually came up while I was modifying the animation. So I just sort of took a break from that and then came back and did this extension. And the reason I think this is uh, helpful is because, uh, sure, we can't actually, well, we can still use these as motion trails and manipulate them, which will manipulate all the pieces, right? Because this is the parent of all those joints. But it also allowed me to use some nice secondary motion on these pieces to get the whole head sort of, you know, slightly uh, do some like lag or jiggle at the end of the, the animation because I noticed that I was playing back. You can see here when it sort of comes together, there's this sort of a forced uh, slide into place. So I wanted to loosen that a little bit. And because there's no one joint for the whole head, it would be really difficult to use all the pieces and have them sort of work uh, in tandem and all the rest of it. So it could be done, but for the sake of keeping things even more clean, um, and for the sake of demonstration, I decided to come back here and extend the skeleton like this. So what's this, the process here? Um, we've got our character here that we bring in via character IO. So now this is a character. This is a proper KineFX character. We no longer care about the cache. And what I want to do is I want to build two joints. So I have here a skeleton swap. Honestly, I just kind of went in and did it by hand because I don't expect or I don't plan to change my character, like it will always be the statue and it, the rest pose will always be this one. So I'm happy to position these joints by hand. There's no need to proceduralize this step. If you think your character will change and you want a, a more procedural setup, then that's a, a different story. So I built those two joints, one at the base, one at the head, and I went ahead and made sure that they're built correctly uh, in terms of where the head is positioned. So it's exactly where the neck breaks from the torso. Afterwards, I have the capture pose here. So I'm grabbing the capture pose and I'm running this through some stuff, which I'll explain in just a second. And then I'm merging the capture pose with the skeleton that I just created. Because the capture pose is not moving, of course, then we can safely do this and it will all be at rest pose. Now, what are these things uh, up here? So I want all my head joints to be parented to this head, sort of parent head joint that I created, right? So to do that, you can see here that I'm actually doing exactly that. I have to create a few groups for the head joints and the base joints. So I can easily parent them and keep everything sort of procedural without having to specify joint names. Uh, if you can help specifying joint names, then it's better because obviously joint names will change if we change the the simulation, right? Because we build the skeleton based on the pieces. So if the simulation changes, the skeleton changes, which results in a different name. So I don't want to use names here. Uh, and instead of names, what I ended up doing is I just kind of went with this strategy of using a box that's placed around the statue, around the base of the statue, and one that's placed around the head of the statue, and just group all the joints within that bounding box. Honestly, this is a bit of a nostalgia for me because it's probably one of the, the first procedural setups that I ever learned in Houdini back, back in the day. So, um, yeah, it's probably more of a, of a throwback to, to the uni years than, uh, than anything else. There's a myriad of other ways you could do this, but honestly, this works just fine, especially if the statue won't change. So I'm building the groups like this. Then in parent joints, I can just say group all the joints from base to my joint called base and to the, the head, the joint called head. Uh, it's safe to use the names for the base and the head because those were created by hand, so this will never change. And afterwards, we want to actually constrain these joints so they follow the animation, right? Because right now, if I transfer the animation over using a skeleton blend, so I'm just essentially taking the, the capture pose with the newly merged in skeleton, and then I'm taking the animated pose and I'm using the skeleton blend to run the animation again. And this will work for all the joints except the joints we've just made because those do not have a counterpart on the animated stream, so they'll just be ignored. You can see that they don't move. Uh, we want to constrain those joints, of course, to the rest of the joints that they uh, are parented to, or that rather constrain the parent to the children, so they move in tandem. And, you know, this is a bit of wrangling to do. Uh, it's not super complicated. I'll try and explain it really quickly. Um, this is for the base. And what I'm doing is 
Uh, I'm probably going to leave the code on screen so you can read through it yourself. I'm not going to explain each line. I'm just going to explain the thought process because I hope if I think it's easier to understand that way. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at the group base here that I'm specifying as a string attribute. I'm looking at all the joints in that group and I'm getting the, the average position of those joints. I'm getting that average position both from the animated stream, so this one, which represents essentially the actual animation itself, and also from the rest pose from this one because we want to keep the offset of the, the joint, the base joint, right? So the base joint already has a position. We want to constrain it to the other ones as kind of a parent constraint that requires offsets. Uh, we don't want to just shift it directly. So that's why I'm requiring both the animated and the rest to compute just the delta that then I can apply onto its original offset. Once that's done, I am just applying it to position, the position of that base joint is exactly that. So I'm getting the constraint point, which is the base joint, which is essentially its position um, at rest pose because there's no animation on the first input, remember that for that particular joint. And onto that offset, I'm applying the delta of the average position of the joints that are children of this joint, which will result in that joint moving. Let me show you the base joint here, if I can find it. Um, base. There you go. So this joint, as you can see up there, it rotates and moves around together with the other joints in the base. Now, another thing I did here, and this is honestly just because uh, I used it for some secondary motion later on, is I did this uh, transfer over of the transform attribute. So I have this point 0.52 specified and I'm just reading its transformation and applying it onto the joint. Now this is a bit naughty because we're using this name which we really shouldn't. Like if we change the input, this will break. But uh, I'm happy to do that thing where I'm just saying, well, you know, like hard coded. Um, so I know if I change anything upstream, this will be, this will break. Uh, if you don't want it, if you don't want to use the name of the joint to transform the transform over, you can just not do that. Like for the head joint, I'm not doing any of that because I couldn't find a joint that's stable enough. But for the base, I actually have a joint that's quite stable. Uh, this one, 0.52, I think, yeah. And this is the joint that we've created, right? That's the, the huge piece. So because this is such a big piece, it stays fairly stable throughout the animation. And the more data we can query, the more data we can then later use for secondary motion or all the rest of it. So, you know, this is kind of a, a finesse where I'm happy to do it now. If I were to change the input or if I knew I would have to go through multiple iterations, I might reconsider or I might look for a more uh, procedural way of specifying which joint to query the transform from. But, you know, just, you know, you can, if you can use it, feel free. You don't have to, but it's extra data. That's always good. So that's it. Now we have our hierarchy that's moving. This still works, of course. Uh, you can augment the skeleton and modify it as you see fit because the base joint and the head joint are not actually captured to the skin. So they don't really matter in the final result. Uh, they will just come along for the ride and give us options to do stuff like this, where we have this whole um, hierarchy in place now and we can use it to deform the the skin further. Okay, and that's a little, little trick that you could do. You can always extend your skeleton as much as you need to, and you can always come back to this and extend it further if you find that there are particular areas of the character which you want a bit more control over. And here we are. This is our last part where finally the actual fun begins. So we're out of RBD. We're out of building the skeleton for this guy. Now all we want to do is we want to take this animation and just play with it, just modify it really. So these are some thoughts here. Honestly, because it's geometry, there's literally endless things you can do with it, like just go wild. Uh, I'll show a few ideas that I had, um, but again, you know, take it as far as you want. So we bring in the character via character IO. <laughs> it's the same thing here. There's no nothing really uh, different where we just have our, our main character. Actually, I'm gonna just bypass all of that for now so we can see it play and you can see it just the same thing. <clears throat> then, um, I'll, I'll guess I'll just break down some of the bits here. One idea is I wanted to have the pieces. So let me also just bypass the blend shape stuff. So I wanted to have the little pieces that you can see on the ground there. 
uh, I want them to be sort of late, like delayed, so they just all sort of spring up and come uh, and rebuild themselves at the end, just to add some extra uh, interesting visual effect, I guess. So what I ended up doing is I'm building a motion clip here out of our joints, which you can see basically this is the whole animation. This is the evaluation of the same motion clip, so it just plays back. Um, and then on the side here, I have a couple more motion clip retimes, which just retimes the whole motion clip. I just went like brutal. I didn't want to, you know, just everything really. Um, there are two of them doing the same same process, but just different values. So this one shifts the animation forward to frame 25. So it starts at frame 25 and it moves about 1.192 faster than the original. And this one moves twice fast, fast and starts at frame 80. Then I'm evaluating these motion clips as well, so you we can see them play uh, differently. So you can see that this one stays put for the first 25 frames, and this one should stay put for the first like 80 frames, okay? And then it starts playing much quicker. And then I'm just using some skeleton blends to blend back to my original stream uh, the pieces that I want. So for this skeleton blend, is I just chose all these small pieces that I mentioned. Uh, so you can actually come here to figure out which one they are, and just zoom in and select them like that. Uh, so I did that, selected all the small pieces, and what does this mean is that now, uh, and then from here I think I've selected some bigger pieces just to get some extra extra variety there. So if I plug this in there and I play, you can see how most pieces move, but then some start later, and then these go up, and all you see those uh, these pieces stay behind, and then they just follow at the end more quickly, more uh, quickly. So that's one, one cool thing you could do. Um, essentially, this is kind of like a time shift. You can time shift each piece by how much you want. Um, <clears throat> and yeah. Uh, next up, I think this one, yeah, this is a simple animation, I'll show a bit later. Oh yeah, the next one, we can do the secondary motion bit because we've built that whole hierarchy for it. So might as well uh, have a look. So what I wanted to do is instead of, as I said before, that sort of finish with that head, like just snapping into place and then not moving at all was a bit too much for me. So I decided to apply some secondary motion on that head joint because that's why we built it. So we have here our head joint, uh, secondary motion software. I'm just connecting some stuff as you can see. I'm building another motion clip up here and not relying on the node to build it for me because um, I wanted to apply the effect over, over over a specific frame range. And in order to do this, you need the actual motion clip first. Um, so yeah, secondary motion. And then I have here the custom frame range. So I just want to effect to start at frame 147 and end at frame 190. I want to influence P because remember our head joint doesn't actually have a rotation. So that's all, all the data we can work with. And then I'm doing some, some lag on it. Uh, and then I'm just blending it back. Um, I'm doing a blend in to not have the effect kick in so quickly, given that it starts at frame 147, right? So it, it might start a bit too abruptly. <clears throat> and I'm doing something similar here for the base, but the base I'm actually using to transform to rotate it a bit. And I'll show right now how this looks. So if I play, it will still play the same thing. So it be the, very similar up until frame 150 or some. <clears throat> Everything builds up and then when it reaches up, you get this nice bounce here. You get the bounce from the base, which rotates slightly, and then you get the bounce of the actual neck position-wise. Uh, you know, if you're going for something too realistic, this might not be might not be the result you're looking for, but I think, you know, it looks quite fun. And um, I like it way more than just having it like snap into place very statically. So this is why we've built essentially those joints before to be able to do this kind of thing. Um, moving on, uh, there's another Rig pose. I'll show that a bit later. That's just uh, an extra thing that I did at the end there. Uh, another thing you can do, which is honestly probably the most obvious use case for um, uh, an example like this with flying pieces all over the place, is we can use the some motion clip. I'll just enable that for now. <clears throat> so you can use that motion clip to extract some motion trails. So these are just a few pieces of our animation. I can show them here. You can see them 
follow exactly that trajectory. So we get the trajectories over time. And then, you know, we can do stuff with it. Like, for example, you can edit uh, them all together. I think this in this one, I'm just kind of rotating them around. You can easily like move them and, and do crazy things like that. And if I play and get the pieces to the point where they will be influenced directly by my edits, uh, actually, you would actually see that if I were plugging the correct output. So let's try that again. If you see the pieces there and I move this around, you can also see them update, which is pretty cool. Okay, there we go. I'm going to undo a couple of times. Anyway, so that's that's one thing you could do, right? Like once you've got the motion trails, because motion trails are essentially just points. So this is just points in space, and that's it. So I can very easily, yeah, just take them away, honestly, the edit, use soft transform, use noise, use any soft tools you can think of that manipulate geometry and points, and you can modify these trails like that. And then all you have to do is you have to do a motion clip update to put that data back onto the motion clip, and that's it. And then an evaluation if you want to evaluate this in a joint deform, for example. And right now, you know, you've got the, the delayed stuff, so each piece is a bit delayed, you get that build up, you get a bit of difference in the motion trail. And then also at the end, I went ahead and added this just for fun. So I basically offset the mouth and then at the end, it just builds it back together using some secondary motion. And if you want to take this even further, you can also add blend shapes to the mix. So here I have my rest geometry, okay? I've built this smirk on its face as a blend shape. It's essentially an edit swap. I just move some geometry, create a blend shape, uh, animate this blend shape, and then if I plug this into my joint deform, you can layer all these effects together. So as this builds, fixes its mouth, and then smirks. And there you go. Um, you can go, again, as far as you can you know, possibly think of, because you've got everything that you need, right? You've got all the, you've got the, the joints, you've got the rest pose. The rest pose is also in a very... Um, like it's just literally like right there, the, the whole statue is uh, at the origin, it's built up, so you can build blend shapes on it, you can do whatever you want with it, and then on this side you just deform it uh, by whatever you fit into the actual input. And um, yeah, that's that's essentially the core of this, of this workshop. Um, I hope that the process uh, seems straightforward enough. I think that the thought process itself makes sense because, you know, to my mind, it's very simple to go from, you know, RBD to KinFX, just because obviously I, I understand the concepts. But I also think that, you know, even for somebody that perhaps is not so familiar with KinFX, just looking at this and seeing how simple it is to just use the geometry uh, and use, you know, we're using Rig Doctor to build the skeleton, so you don't have to know necessarily uh, what attributes the joints need in order to be a valid skeleton. Just use the Rig Doctor, and that takes care of this for you. And as you layer these uh, things on top of each other, you essentially get from a, a mesh, a polygon mesh, that you break apart using simulations, you get a full-blown actual character that you can you know, even animate using rig pose or other KinFX tools, or manipulate using SOP geometry um, tools that have nothing to do with actual character. So before we close things off, I wanted to do a quick round trip to the beginning to change the RPD sim and just see how this thing can propagate uh, throughout the network. So I don't expect the modifier to work here because again, this is very specific to the current skeleton that we have in place. And I think that's fine. Uh, most of the setup that we have in modify, as you just saw, is not really meant to be uh, like generic, right? So it's quite specific to the animation. So I'm happy to leave this out. What I'm interested in, in the, is it the skeleton itself, how it's being built. So you can come back up here to the RBD um, and let's just change this a little bit. So I'm going to come here to the ballistic path. Okay, I'm going to change my position of the sphere. So I'm going to put this, you know, over to a different side. So maybe let's do something like this. And I was going to change the seed here. So we get a different point. So maybe we do that one on that side. That's fine. Uh, and that's that's Basically, it. I'm going to come here to the RBD solver and I'm going to run it. So actually, let's just go to the solver so we can see the collision geometry as well. So I'm going to run this and wait for it to go. You can see the sphere firing from a different position now and it's going to hit. It's going to 
already break some pieces up there, kind of make the whole thing fall backwards. Feeling like a sports commentator now. Okay, that's... Sure. Whatever, it's fine. Uh, I probably wouldn't keep it if it weren't for the sake of, of another example. But it's, I mean, it's cool that it all breaks apart on the floor. You can see it's a, it creates quite of a mess, leaving some pieces on the table. Anyway, so we got a new animation. We're happy with it. I'm going to go to the out mesh here, and I'm going to save this uh, in a different place. I'm going to just do like a mesh 2 type thing here. And I'm going to do save to disk. Whoops. So we're going to save that over to disk, 190 frames again. And let's see what we've done. So I'm going to come here to build skeleton first. Okay. And we're going to be using the bottom network because that's the, the finished one, the more complete one. And I'm going to specify here our mesh two. Yeah. So this has changed and I expect this to be, yeah. So it's still working. It's still play, playing back. But if we can see it's the different, it's the new uh, animation. Okay. So now I'm going to have a look at my character. Um, and this seems to be working. We have our KineFX character. Uh, let's check our joints. Yep, we've got a bunch of joints here. We can see we have multiple joints because we have multiple pieces now, so 93, okay? But this is all working because of course we're just using the pieces and our nice fuse algorithm also works quite nicely to keep at least uh, some of these big parts together here. Um, Okay, so this is working. Then we can come here and export this. So my marble statue two or something. So I can do a save to disk. And then we can also come here to the extend skeleton. So we can bring in our uh, character marble statue two. And then if we have a look at our joint deform, we can see it still works correctly. Now we have this hard coded value here, which probably will not match anymore. So we can you know just kill this for now. Um, and yeah, we can find another joint if we really want to. Uh, we can see that this still works. And if I use the rig pose, let's kill everything. We see we've got our base here, which still works correctly. We've got our head here, which still works correctly. Um, and yeah, so essentially this, the setup seems to be correct. Uh, it seems to be adaptable really easily. We can keep changing the input and we're getting a new skeleton or a new character every time. And now once we have this already built, we can go ahead and uh, modify or create, you know, basically another geometry like a modify two. Come over here. I'm going to switch this to, or actually we haven't exported this. So let me export this as well as a full skeleton two. Save to disk. And then I'm going to come here to modify and I'm going to query the second one and reload geometry. And we should have that done. Uh, I think the blend shape should still work here. Yeah, the blend shape is still working, of course, because it's the same topology. But obviously, everything else probably needs to be adjusted. Uh, the, the motion clip side of things uh, can be used still. I just have to change the skeleton blends here. But again, as I said, I think this is also very specific to the actual uh, shot. And, you know, there's no, there's no point in trying to keep this more procedural uh, unless you know you'll be dealing with a multitude of motions that are quite similar. So let's say I would want to apply secondary motion on the base and on the head constantly or something like this. Uh, but otherwise, I can just, you know, take it away from here and just work on making this fun and cool, the actual reconstruction itself, because the skeleton has already been built for me by the network that I just set up. So that being said, thank you very much for following along. Um, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact us. And I hope you have enjoyed and potentially picked up a thing or two. Thanks a lot for watching. Have a good one. Cheers.